72,000 people died of drug overdoses in the United States in 2017. Just over 10,000 of those were caused by meth. That's a stat that comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And that's not a very happy statistic. I know, drug abuse isn't a super happy topic to discuss, but that is what is at the heart of Beautiful Boy. Welcome, my name is Kyle Marshall and this is Book vs. Film. And because this is such a serious topic, maybe some levity is needed before we jump into it. Matt, can you say something funny? Oh god. Um, t uh, two bars walking to a person. Guess not. Beautiful Boy is a book that was published in 2008, written by journalist David Sheff. In it, he describes his early life, falling in love, getting married, having a son, falling out of love, getting a divorce, and then the struggle to raise that son when the parents live in different states. While there is certainly a lot of self-blame and ultimately self-discovery, this is a story about trying to understand his son, who is an addict. David wants to see him get well, but is unsure if that will ever be a reality. Right from chapter one, we understand the helplessness that David feels. Whenever he was late or failed to call, I assumed catastrophe. He was dead, always dead. We soon learn that this is a common occurrence, that David's son Nick has disappeared multiple times before, that David lives in a continual sense of helplessness because he doesn't know how to save his son. So he does what any good reporter would do, he starts researching. And this is where the most eye-opening parts of the book are, where he goes into detail on how meth is created, distributed, and also how it affects the human body after it is taken. It really is this insidious drug, a drug that causes holes to form in the brain, a drug that convinces the user that everyone is out to get them, a drug that causes users to abandon everyone they love in order to get more of it. It's the most abused hard drug, and as described in the book, meth makes you feel bright and shiny. It also makes you paranoid, delusional, destructive, and self-destructive. Then, you will do unconscionable things in order to feel bright and shiny again. The saddest sentence that I think I've read recently is the realization that David comes to when he writes, No matter what we do, no matter how we agonize or obsess, we cannot choose for our children whether they live or die. And that's the hardest lesson for him to learn. As hard as it is for a parent to do, the majority of this book is David coming to grips with what is in his control and what isn't. When he first discovers that Nick is using, he tries to be authoritarian and order him to stop, but that doesn't work. Then he tries to be supportive and that doesn't work. What he ends up doing and is coached to do by therapists and other parents of addicts is to cut off money and support until they help themselves which is against every instinct a parent has. And for the first half of this book, I was riveted by David's story, the ups and downs, the near deaths, and the hopeful successes. But addiction is something that is not easily fixed. Nick has many times where he goes months being clean, and then he uses again, and the familiar dread creeps into David's life. David has remarried, he has two young children, everyone loves Nick. David's first wife is also portrayed as loving and supportive of her son. However, everyone's lives are upended each time Nick relapses. Different treatments are sought, new remedies, different tactics, but always there is that same dread. David's younger children's outlooks are often the most eye-opening because they haven't been taught to filter their own feelings yet. Like this passage, Jasper responded, I don't think he wants to do them, but he can't help it. It's like in cartoons when some character has a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. The devil whispers into Nikki's ear and sometimes it gets too loud so he has to listen to him. The angel is there too, Jasper continues, but he talks softer and Nick can't hear him. The tragedy is that even after stealing money, being violent, putting people in danger, this family loves Nick. They allow him into their lives when a non-family member would have been run out years before. However, by the midpoint, the book feels almost hopeless. The continued relapses and lies caught up with me, the reader, and I found myself disgusted and frustrated with Nick, which I'm sure is only a small percentage of what David felt. For me, I thought that the last half of the narrative could have been edited it down because we hear the same type of thing with the same lessons learned multiple times and it becomes too repetitive. Especially after David worries himself into an aneurysm. That part of the story is also gripping, but after that he has accepted his reality with Nick and we don't need to belabor the point. The last passage reads, I call Nick to say hi. We talk a while. He sounds, he sounds like Nick, my son back. What's next? We'll see. Before hanging up he says, give Karen, Jass, and Daisy my love. Then he says he has to go. It seems like such a normal passage, but after reading the book, that leaves you feeling hopeful 
with also a big dose of dread. And while there's obvious allusions to the song Beautiful Boy by John Lennon throughout the book, I think another song referenced brings even greater weight. It's Sunrise Sunset from A Fiddler on the Roof. And no, I won't sing. But the lyrics are, Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, swiftly fly the years, one season following another, laden with happiness and tears. That nicely sums up the book. The movie was just released in a limited run. I'm sure it'll be on streaming in no time. It was written by Luke Davies and Felix von Greningen. It was directed by Felix von Greningen, and it stars Steve Carell and Timothy Chalamet. In many ways, this is the anti-Breaking Bad, the story that was playing out behind the scenes as we obsessed over Walter White's ascension to drug king, the lives that were ripped apart, and the families that will never again be quite whole. Overall, it's a compressed retelling of what happens in the book by trying to put it into a three-act structure. Structure. And I need to make a weird comparison right from the very beginning to a movie I can almost guarantee nobody else has actually seen. As a somewhat closeted wrestling fan, there was a documentary that came out a few years ago called The Resurrection of Jake the Snake. I loved it, mostly because I grew up with Jake as a wrestler and remember him fondly, but also because it didn't shy away from the horrible, insidious nature of addiction. You see Jake slip off the wagon multiple times to the point where you want to yell at the screen because you just want to see him succeed. Succeed. And it clicked with me that that is why addiction is so harmful to families and individuals. It never really goes away. It could always rear its ugly head. But I bring that up because I think that that documentary does a better job than this fiction film. That's not to say that it's bad. In fact, all the actors do a great job and it's shot well, but the execution feels slight. Even without knowing the story, it feels like they are rushing through plot points. Timothy Chalamet proves that he is a great talent. His seesawing between charming and repulsive works, you both want to see him succeed and hate him for what he is doing to the family. Steve Carell has a beard, which means this is a dramatic film, but he plays the worried dad effectively, even though the role doesn't really give him much to work with. He's just a concerned dad throughout the whole thing. It's a messy story they are adapting. I don't know if there is a great way to go about trying to adapt this book because there's no real structure to what happened. There is no happy ending or even a definitive tragic ending. It's just a burden and a hardship that needs to be endured and will continue after the credits roll. Everybody tries their best, but I felt throughout that there wasn't enough there there. Does that make sense? What I mean is that I understand the gravity and could see how it was affecting everyone, but without having the time to see Nick as his younger self, to see Nick without drugs, then I, as a viewer, can't fully feel the weight of the tragedy. This movie runs two hours, but I think we needed just a tiny bit longer with David and Nick, especially in the younger years, before we could appreciate what was lost. And because of that, it never comes together to form a completely satisfying experience, even though the subject matter is important. So what are the similarities. The basic plot is the same between the book and the movie. We see Nick succumbing to drugs repeatedly and attempting to get better. In both, there really is no end. We can see the helplessness in these characters because we know that they will be struggling with this for years. David doesn't have an aneurysm in the movie even though we see him in constant worry. We never really get to see the kids' perspective of things, mostly because they don't age them up very much throughout the runtime. And they bring in Nick's memoir, Tweak, to fill in some of the gaps. I didn't read that memoir, so I won't comment on that, but I'm guessing that is where the ending and a certain near-death experience comes from. So which was better? While I don't think either rises to greatness, I definitely recommend the book to people if they were interested in the story. I think that you get a better understanding on addiction, and it doesn't come off as overdone exposition. Plus, there are some really great and moving passages which the film never rises to. So overall, out of 5, I'd probably give the book 3.5 out of 5, and the movie a 3 out of 5. So the book just edges out the movie. That's just my opinion. I'd love to know yours. So what do you prefer? Book? Film? Let me know down in the comments below. Until next time, have a great day and please let me know what you think I should use as a sign-off because I have no idea. I have, st I have stood here, not stood here, I have sat here for a good five minutes trying to figure this out and Matt is no help. Toodaloo. Toodaloo everyone.